Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. I always try the British accent when I'm doing poetry, uh, but I just, I'm not sure if I can really pull it off. Plus, it's a poop emoji. Anyway, hey friends, welcome to the Alyosha Society where we are pursuing truth, beauty, and goodness through great literature. Oh, wait a second. I need to get rid of this get up. Uh, I tell you what, I got a shortcut. Yeah, there we go. Woo, much better. In this video, we're starting a new unit. But you already knew that, didn't you? As soon as I turned it on, you said, Bruce, you've got on a different shirt. That means new unit. That's right. Uh, if you're taking the course and you're doing all the books, then you know that blue shirt was for Pilgrim's Progress, which we already covered, and red shirt was for Gulliver's Travels, and uh, this is what I chose for our new unit on poetry. I know it's pink. <laughs> I'm six foot four, 250 pounds. I look like a giant Easter egg. Anyway, people can see me coming. That's a good thing. Yeah, I don't tend to get hit by cars or buses. Well, we have a lot to cover in this video. This video is going to be more of an introduction to poetry. In this first unit, we are going to be focused on two poets in particular, Anne Bradstreet and John Milton, both of them 17th century poets, fitting, because the works that we've been reading are right within that time period. But I've got a lot to talk about, so let's get right to it. whole lot to talk about today. Oh, yes, poetry. It's going to be a hoot, friends. It really is. How to understand and enjoy poetry. You know, when you think of poetry, you might think uh, pretty simply like I do. You know, I'm not a very complicated guy. You know, roses are red, violets are blue. I like reading books, and uh, so should you. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not really a poet so much, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to get way more complicated than roses are red and violets are blue. We're going to stick with our historical biographical approach. We're going to examine different kinds of poetry and Remember, 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 this course is focusing more on how to read, how to enjoy a book, a novel, a poem. And the whole point is we're doing as many different genres as we can. In fact, just about everything we're doing is a different genre. Allegory, satire, and now we come to poetry. So, the question that hopefully comes to mind, and if it doesn't, it should always come to mind when you start a new study, is what in the world is this thing? How do you define it? And you're thinking, Bruce, we know what poetry is. Well, pause the video. I challenge you to pause the video and come up with a definition of poetry. It's not as easy as you think. What is it that makes something a poem as opposed to some other kind of writing. Well, I thought about that a lot, and then I realized I needed to go to Merriam-Webster. Yeah, I, I just need to go right to the dictionary. Let's see what Merriam-Webster has to say about poetry. What is it that makes it distinct? <clears throat> well, first of all, poetry is metrical, usually. Now, again, you know, these days, People will put just about anything in the literary blender and mix it up and, and spit it out and call it whatever they want. What I'm talking about here is historically, how has this thing been understood? And, it, and poetry has been understood to have what we call meter. Meter. So what is meter? Meter could refer to the length of a line, usually. So penta meter, or as we usually say, pentameter, means 10 syllables. Hexameter, or as we usually say, hexameter, hex means six, 
So it means that whatever is going on in that line, there are six of them. Sometimes it's dactyls, I'll define that later. Sometimes it's syllables, iambic pentameter. But poetry generally has, what, why? Well, the, having a, a set number of syllables will give this kind of writing something that this and this do not have. And that is a kind of rhythm, a structure, almost like a beat in a, in a song. And it's easy to feel the rhythm and the beat. And after a while, you feel like you're doing a jump rope. Okay, wait, no, no, no. I got really messed up there. No, it, 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 and it makes it easier to memorize. So it's metrical. We'll talk about that a lot more. Productions of the Poet. Secondly, I wanted to point out, poetry tends to be a medium or a genre, as we've said, a type of writing that allows more for the imagination to, to really kind of fly because of the different literary devices and elements and, and all the tools that you have in the toolbox when you're doing poetry. And sometimes poetry, as Merriam-Webster says here, is designed to elicit a specific emotional response. So it's a good way to express your feelings through meaning, sound, and rhythm. So some poetry rhymes. All poetry does not rhyme, and some, but some does. And that heightens, in some cases, the emotional expression. So something like in the poetry, especially in the beauty of expression, or sometimes we call it aesthetics. Aesthetics is the study of beauty. Now, you know what I say at the beginning of every single video, and you know it by now. Welcome to the Alyosha Society, where we are pursuing truth, beauty, and goodness. Those are the transcendentals. Those are the things that transcend tribe and language and time period and nation and they are the they are that we call them the transcendentals and we study them because they give us they are a reflection of the nature and character of god god is ultimate truth capital t god is ultimate beauty with a capital b and god is ultimate goodness with a capital g so when we do poetry we've been focusing a lot on truth you know, truth, beauty, and goodness, the truth part. Here, we talked about a lot of doctrine and philosophies here. With poetry, we tend to focus a little bit more on the beauty aspect, the emotional response as well. So let's talk about different kinds of poetry. Before we get there, poetry is like baseball. What? Bruce, I cannot think of one single way that poetry is like baseball. How in the world is poetry like baseball? Well, it is like baseball in this way. If you know the rules, it'll make a lot more sense. Think about it. If you're from a foreign country, you come to the United States, you watch a baseball game, you probably have no idea what in the world is going on. It's a little bit complicated, isn't it? When you know the rules, it makes a lot more sense. I remember the first time I tried to get into hockey. I'm not a huge hockey fan, but... A friend of mine came over and said, Bruce, we're going to watch a hockey game, and I'm going to explain the rules to you. And you know what? When he explained the rules to me, I actually kind of liked it. I'm like, oh, I kind of have a better understanding of what's going on. Poetry is like that. So there are different kinds of poetry, just like there are different kinds of sports, and you have to know the rules for each one, and it'll make a lot more sense. So... Let's get right to it. What kinds of poetry are we going to be looking at? Well, as I said earlier, this unit is going to focus primarily on Anne Bradstreet and John Milton. But we're going to do much more than that. This is a poetry unit. I want to teach you some things generally about poetry so you can kind of sort of become conversant in the world of poetry. And then we'll specifically focus on those two poets. So what we're going to look at here are, now look guys, before I get started, there are 
dozens and dozens and dozens of types of poetry. I am just giving you a sampling of what this looks like. So then if you go and study a different kind of poetry on your own, you'll kind of have the tools to do, to do a better job of that and hopefully enjoy it and appreciate it a lot more. So I just picked a few. The first one is called Hebrew poetry. The second one we're gonna look at is called epic poetry. One of my favorites. Italian poetry, sonnets, and then we're going to look at modern poetry. So I kind of sort of went a little bit chronologically here. Hebrew poetry is going to be very, very ancient, and then we're going to come up to modern poetry. So we're going to look at these five different kinds or types of poetry and look at just how vastly different they are. They don't even seem like they would be the same genre. They're so different, but they're all still in the category of poetry. Let's, let's get started. Let's look at each one of these. First of all, Hebrew poetry. Did you know, this might just blow your mind, friends, that about one-third of the Bible is poetry? Now, guys, the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. It is the only book we have on the planet that is the, the reliable word of God himself, the true and living God, the creator of the universe, the eternal logos, three in one, and he chose to communicate his truth to humanity in poetry, one third of it. There's some historical narratives, there are some epistles, there are some other styles, but there's no style, there's no genre that there's more of in the Bible than poetry. Who knew? That, my friends, is why poetry is important. That's just one reason it's important. I want you to remember that, about a third of the Bible. Now, what kind of poetry is it? You're thinking, Bruce, I don't know of any roses are red, violets are blue, or shall we compare thee to a summer's day in the Bible? Yeah, well, that's because you may not have realized that it's poetry, and I'm going to explain it to you. The poetry in the Bible, what we call Hebrew poetry, consists of many, 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 many parallelisms. I'm going to explain those in a minute. But here's something that's important to keep in mind. Hebrew poetry is thought-based, not sound-based. What? What does that mean? How can it still be poetry? No, it is. It still has rhythm. It still has structure, very specific structure. But instead of sounds rhyming, violets are, roses are red, violets are blue, I love reading and so should you. Instead of hearing that the sounds rhyme, it's ideas that rhyme and that are parallel in some way. What are you talking about? Well, I'll show you. I'm going to show you two Bible verses, Proverbs 16, 16, and then I'm going to show you Psalm 1, 6. There are two different types of parallelisms. And again, I'm just, guys, this is just a sampling. And there are many other kinds of parallelisms. Just wanted to give you a sample. So here we go. Let's take a look at the first one. How much better to get wisdom than gold? To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. That's what's called a synonymous parallelism. Synonymous meaning the same. So in a synonymous parallelism, an idea is set forth, and then that idea that same idea is repeated in the second line for emphasis. It's not really actually expanding the meaning of, it, of the first idea. It's just reinforcing it and making it stronger and helping you to remember it. So what's the message here? What's the idea? Wisdom is better than anything else in life. It's better than gold. So Knowing Hebrew poetry tells me, uh, or knowing the parallelisms here, tells me that the word understanding in the second line, it means the same thing as the word wisdom in the first line. 
And even though silver and gold are not the same thing, in this particular passage of poetry, they represent the same thing, which is something super, super valuable, but still not as valuable as wisdom slash understanding. These guys, if you go to, the, go to the book of Proverbs and Psalms, and you will see synonymous parallelisms all over the place. That's Hebrew poetry. Let me show you one more. This is Psalm 1-6. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. That's what's called an antithetical parallelism. So the idea is set forth in the first line, and then not the same idea, but actually it's opposite. It's antithesis. That's why it's called antithetical. Is set forth in the second line. God knows the way of the righteous. So the righteous are, are, are known by God. The ungodly shall perish. So there's a difference between being righteous and ungodly. They're opposites, not the same. And being known by God and perishing, because I know that this is an antithetical parallelism, it makes the passage uh, uh, make a lot more sense. Because then I know that being known by God and perishing are opposites. So the opposite of dying or spiritual death is to be known by God. Now, see, I might not have picked all of that up in both of these passages if I didn't understand the rules of Hebrew poetry. Yeah, pretty cool, isn't it? All right, let's go to the second kind of poetry, epic. Epic poetry. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you noticed. I meant to point this out to you in my previous slide. Yeah, I have an image up here that represents each different type of poetry. This is Isaiah the prophet Isaiah. You look through the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, the minor prophets, Micah, Obadiah, they're all poetry. They're all written in, in the form of Hebrew poetry. That's why it's a third of the Bible. Yeah. All right, second type of poetry, epic poetry. Ooh, what is epic poetry? Well, that's a picture of Homer down there. You may be familiar with Homer if you've read the Odyssey or the Iliad, but hey, never fear, my friends. I have a nice little mnemonic device to help you remember epic poetry. Yeah, you just remember the four letters, E-P-I-C. Yeah, I know, right? E-P-I-C, epic. Hmm, all right, what exactly is epic poetry? It's an extremely long, there's your E, poem, there's your P, about an incredible, there's your I, hero, which highlights a k culture. That's it. An extremely long poem about an incredible hero which highlights a culture. Let me show you some examples. The Iliad. That, my friends, is one poem. Yeah, it's, uh, mm, it's almost 600 pages. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think, 14 or 15,000 lines. Yeah, extremely long poem about an incredible hero. In this case, Achilles. This whole poem is about Achilles. What is it about Achilles? It's about his anger and the problems that his anger caused during the time of the Trojan War. And what is Homer trying to accomplish here? He's trying to tell us something about Greek culture. He's trying to tell us that, hey, we Greeks, we have this, this idea of what a hero is like, but we, we might need to rethink that. And anger can cause a lot of problems in a culture. Same with the Odyssey. You may have read the Odyssey, also by Homer. It's also extremely long. It's not quite as long as the Iliad, but still, I think it's in the twelve to 13,000 line range. It's an extremely long poem about an incredible hero, Odysseus. 
which once again highlights a culture. It's praising Greek culture. And it's saying that, hey, Greek culture, we need to be more like Odysseus. We need to come home. We need to be settled. We need to be peace-loving people, not war-loving people like Achilles. So that's epic poetry. Another good example of epic poetry would be the Aeneid, the Aeneid by Virgil, who's actually copying Homer. So friends, when you know, when you know that that's what an epic poem is, it makes a lot more sense when you read it. You know, you know the rules of baseball, it actually makes more sense. I want to read a passage to you from the Aeneid and highlight one other thing. And that is the meter that epic poetry tends to use. It's called dactylic hexameter. A dactyl is a finger. I know, just a Greek word for finger. Now, if you look at your finger, you have one long uh, section, and then you have two little sections. You ever notice that? Yeah, just stick your finger out and bend it. So it's long, short, short. Long, short, short. That's a dactyl. It's just a fancy, it's just a Greek word for finger. But it's dactyl hexameter. Hex means six, so six fingers. That's all dactylic hexameter means is six fingers. Well, what's a finger? Da, da, da. A long syllable, then two short ones. Da, da, da. Well, what would it sound like if you did a dactylic hexameter? Six fingers. Da, 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 da. They throw a little da, da. Da, 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 da. Every single line, all the way through both epics, it written in that meter. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing that Homer and Virgil were able to pull this off. And that's why I put Virgil's first line in Latin. Now, guys, I'm not a professional at reading Latin. I'm just going to read it for you. But somebody that really, really knows their Latin well could read this with the dactylic hexameter and the rhythm a lot better. But I'll read it for you. Arma virum quecano, Troia qui primus aboris. Italium fato profugus, Lavinia que wanes. Again, if I could do that a little bit better, you'd hear the da, 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 da. That is so typical of epic poetry. All right, moving right along. Third kind, Italian poetry. Picture of Dante there. What is different about Italian poetry? What are the rules? Well, first of all, it has a melodious harmony. Hmm, that's a little different. Some of the other kinds didn't necessarily have that. It is characterized by a structure called terza rima. Terza rima. Terza refers to the number three, rima, rhyme, or structure. So here's what it looks like. Here's Italian poetry, Dante. There are these stanzas that are three lines each, and here's the rhyme scheme they have, and I'm going to show you that. I'm going to highlight this for you. A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C, and then it goes on. So take a note of that, A, B, A. So in other words, there's a, a syllable, I mean a, a, a sound that ends the first line, we'll call that A, then a different sound that ends the second line, and then the same sound that ends the first line ends the third line, A, B, A. You see that? And then you take the B from the previous line, and the B becomes the new A. And then there's a new sound introduced we call C. You see? Oh, Bruce, come on. Come on, really? No, okay. Italian poetry. This is from Dante's Inferno. Now, I've tried to highlight the words a little bit for you so it makes some sense. And my Italian's pretty rusty. So, Justizia mosse il mio alto fattore. There's a fattore, it's the end of the first line. Fecemi la divina podestate, la soma sapiens el primo amore. Now, so the fattore and the amore, those are your A's. 
the podestate is your B. Now notice the B becomes the new A in the second stanza. Denantia menon for cose create, senon eterne eo eterno duro. Oh, new sound now, which is going to be our, our C. Lasciate ogni speranza voi centrate. So if I had another stanza up here, the duro would then become the first and the third lines in terms of the sound. So that's called terza rima. And Dante keeps up that melodious, that harmony. It's absolutely divine. Well, it's the divine comedy. That's why it's, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Beautiful to hear somebody that really knows what they're doing read terza rima. All right, next kind of poetry, sonnets. There are many different kinds of sonnets, but I think we all know who the sonnet king is, and that is a picture of Shakespeare, of course. What exactly is a sonnet? What makes it distinct? Well, first of all, a sonnet has 14 lines, and it's written in iambic pentameter, which, once again, guys, these are just fancy words that you can throw out at dinner parties, but they don't really mean anything all that fancy. Penta just means 10. It just means 10 syllables. 10 meters. So iambic pentameter just means 10 feet. So it has 10 syllables in each line. We're going to look at an example in a minute. And the rhyme scheme is pretty simple, but I'll tell you why it's effective. There's a A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. So there's this rhythm that you get into and then like a bump, ah, like a one-two punch at the end. And it really, it's, it's really very powerful. The most famous sonnet is the one I was quoting at the beginning of this video, which uh, is sonnet number 18 by Shakespeare. And you probably have it memorized, but take a look at the A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, ba, ba. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, thou art more lovely and more temperate, Rough winds to shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. A, B, A, B. Sometime too hot the, the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature changing course untrimmed. C, D, C, D. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wondrous in his shade when eternal lines to time thou growest. E F E F. Now, bah, bah, the big one too. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see. So long lives this, and this gives life to me. He's talking about the poem itself. Now, you know, hey, everything you see in nature, it's beautiful, but it fades eventually, and there's some problem with it. It's it's not eternal. But you, you, my love, he says. Your eternal summer will never fade. And even, and even if you do grow old, you're going to live forever in my poem. So long lives this, and this constantly gives life to thee. I love sonnets. You can probably tell that. And that brings us to the last kind of poetry, modern poetry. And you know what, guys? It's a little bit of a free-for-all. Yeah, modern poetry doesn't necessarily rhyme in any way. Sounds, ideas, uh, there's not necessarily a specific meter or rhythm to it. And that's fine. That's just characteristic of the world we live in. It's characteristic of the worldview. There, there's not really a standard. It, modern poetry doesn't really have any specific rules. That's a picture of <clears throat> one of my favorite modern day poets, Maya Angelou. I've actually seen her live before many, many years ago when I was in college. She came to our college and recited some of her poetry. And I'll be introducing, uh, yeah, uh, this is Maya Angelou right here. She's, she's got a ton of poetry, a ton of, and she's done a lot of famous things like read at, you know, presidential events, inaugurations and things like that. But anyway, here is her When Great Trees Fall. It's just a portion of it because it's a, it's a long poem. 
When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder. Lions hunker down in tall grasses and even elephants lumber after safety. See, no specific rhythm or rhyme. When great trees fall, but there is that repetition, which is effective in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. There's a little bit of alliteration in there. So there are definitely some literary devices that are being used, repetition, alliteration, and so forth, but not necessarily a specific meter. By the way, in this poem, great trees probably refers to great human beings, you know, famous people, influential people, when they fall, you know, say morally or something like that, the ripple effects are tremendous. The dominoes that fall because we put them up on a pedestal, you know, elephants lumber after safety and small things recoil into silence. Their senses eroded beyond fear. It's a powerful poem. Yeah, it's a wonderful poem. It just doesn't necessarily have any specific meter to it. Okay, friends. So those are just five different types of poetry. Uh, I, I think there are five really good ones for you to know about. And as we do, you know, discussion boards and quizzes and things, th those will be the ones that I'll be asking you questions about. I'm trying to find a place to stick my face here. But moving forward, let's wrap up this video. We're going to get into Ann Bradstreet and John Milton specifically. But keep in mind, guys, that we're still going to be using the same approach I've been talking about over and over, the historical biographical approach. Do you remember what that means? It means that we're going to learn as much as we can about the author. It means that we're going to be talking about why did this person write this and to whom? When did Ann Bradstreet live? When did John Milton live? That is going to color how we understand their poetry. And which type of poetry is it? And can we also learn a little bit more about all of the wonderful tools in the toolbox of the poet? We call those literary devices, literary devices. So more on that to come in the next video. I got to tell you, friends, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the pink shirt. I'm going to stick with it through our poetry unit. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care, friends.